Hi, I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here on site at IBM's Think 2023 event. I'm going to go into the Think Forum, where IBM has a lot of really interesting demos set up, and take a look around and see what they're doing in the areas of AI, security, sustainability, and a couple of things. So let's go into the Expo Hall, have a look around, and get some good demos of what IBM's doing. Okay, I'm in the sustainability area inside Think Forum now, and I'm here with John Champa, and you are Tyler? I work with our sustainability software division. We look at how to operationalize sustainability goals for our clients. So you're the sustainability guru, I'll just call you that. Sure, How's that? sure. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so I attended the keynote this morning on sustainability. I thought it was pretty interesting. In fact, the most salient data point I took away was that 95% of companies actually have ESG plans, right? They, everyone wants to make the world a better place, but only 10% of companies actually understand how to operationalize that, right? Why, why do you think that is? Well, that, it's absolutely right. And you know, as mentioned in the keynote earlier, a bit of it's a bit a data gap, but also we have siloed systems. And so what we're demonstrating here is how you can take these mission critical softwares that are usually siloed within line of businesses. You have your asset management, your facilities and buildings management, you have your ESG reporting software, and you have your climate adaptation or your risk management software. These tend to be different users that are using them that don't really interact with each other throughout the broader organization, especially when you get into big organization. So what we've demonstrated here is we've got a neat little demo where we have some clients that are really seeing the value and the benefit from tying these mission critical software sets together in order to be able to gain insights but also operationalize those goals that are being made at the boardroom level. Okay, so how does how does this demo work? So this demo works. So right here we're showcasing three software sets. One our Maximo application suite, which is a key software for asset management. We have Invisi, which is a key software for our ESG reporting and where you really start to build that single data lake for your ESG data to be able to make action of it and build insights on it. And then we have the IBM Environmental Intelligence Suite, which is where you really start looking at risk mitigation, climate adaptation, how do certain uh, weather perils impact my operations, as well as how do I forecast out the risk from climate change on my business. And in here, you'll see we've, took, we've taken three, a uh, total of four different use cases across those three software sets where we're tying them together to see how a sustainability manager is able to accomplish what they need to within an organization off these data sets and software, a facilities manager, an asset manager, and then your risk manager, the person looking at climate adaptation. So we're gonna jump into one here which is around climate adaptation. This is a great example where we've taken Maximo, Invisi, and EIS, we've married them together to be able to deliver a real benefit and value to the client around a specific use case. The use case is when severe weather is coming into a certain area, we're up here in New England, for this particular cityscape where we're gonna have an icing event on this particular cityscape you see behind me. And what happens during an icing event is you typically have operations set threshold. And there's a heating element on the track called a, a switch heater. And that consumes a lot of propane and produces a lot of emissions. And typically when you get your overall weather feed into your operations, that triggers that those melters across your entire service territory to turn on. So the first thing you want to do is you want to gain environmental intelligence to understand how the weather is going to impact you. The second thing you want to do is understand when your melters are turned on, where are they located, and you want to marry that data that we're pulling from Maximo on where they're located with your environmental data to be able to understand what your overall area is for where you have the melters on and the actual weather impacting. As so historically, this would be done all manually. This would right? be done all manually. Yeah. This is a this is a t traditionally a, uh, a, a high cost, low value manual process where, like I said, that temperature filled with errors. Yeah, filled <laughs> with errors because human errors. You know, yeah. they're filled with errors. And traditionally, what would happen is all the melters would turn on and you'd leave them on for the duration of that oh. 30, 72 hour storm. But we know storms are moving, so there, if you have a large service territory, you might be leaving on certain aspects of your melters that no longer are at risk of freezing. And until usually you get that manual process of the engineer, the conductor's going through and actually turning waste, off and waste manually. Waste would be huge, right? Yeah. Waste would yeah. be huge. So here's where you create a digital representation of your tracks with your heaters, as well as your asset information. And you can start to gain insights on where you should actually keep on your melters. In particular, this thing, the north west switch section is gonna be the most impacted for the duration of the storm. And you can start to phase out your other switches. And therefore you can start to, for those switch heaters, definitely take action and automate the ability to turn on the tickets needed to start turning those off within the system. The cool thing is, 
we've kind of gamified this so it's giving you the scenario with some data points and you're making the decision. You start to see in real time, those operators, those asset managers are starting to see in real time that by slowly phasing out over 72 hours, the switches versus leaving them all on, that particular incident's contributing to a 6% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Mm -hmm. It also correlates to a reduction in fuel usage, which is a cost metric. So it's a beautiful marriage of where we're operationalizing both ESG data, asset data, and environmental data to really allow for you to focus on both profits and your purpose around redu reducing your emissions. You also can then trend out and forecast long-term impact. Are you on target to meet your annual goals related to greenhouse gas emissions or, or costs. And that's basically in a nutshell. We have a number of examples here that we kind of go through if you wanted to do other uh, challenges. Yeah, no, that's great. And uh, certainly appreciate it. And uh, so IBM, uh, you're marrying AI with sustainability and making it easier for companies to deploy. Exactly. So, okay. Thanks, John. Thank you. Okay, well, I'm in the security area now inside Think Forum, and I'm here with John Lee. Your title is? Uh, program Director for Key Radar Product Marketing. Okay, and uh, you know, security obviously is a big theme here, right? Uh, AI, I think, has been looked at to help close the gap in security. In fact, I remember in Arvin's keynote, he talked about a, one of the websites you manage gets 50 million attacks a day or something yeah. like that. And uh, in the security keynote today, they brought up some interesting data points around uh, the gap that's occurring now between security and uh, the people trying to fight it, right? Yep. So, uh, can you? Uh, what are you showing here uh, with Q Radar? Yeah, great, uh, great questions, uh, Zeus. So here we have our Q Radar suite, and this is our console. Uh, so I'll quickly show you, um, you know, how we're helping security analysts, SOC organizations, really uh, accelerate their response and their investigation, right? So and, and Q Radar, to be clear, right? Uh, I I've always historically thought of it as a sim. Yeah. But you've built a lot of other functionality here, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, we're going beyond sim. So last week at uh, RSA, we announced our Q Radar suite, and now you have Q Radar sim, SOAR, EDR, and Log Insights. So okay. Let me just jump into this quick demo and kind of show you some of the cool features that we have. Uh, so even before an analyst sits down for the day, we've automated some of the investigation tasks, right? So here, this is our case view, um, and the Q Radar console has already prioritized a set of events and alerts into cases. So we've automated investigation, so you can quickly sit down at the beginning of the day and say, okay, where should I work on, and what, what threats are relevant, and how should I investigate them? So if I take a look at this particular phishing attack here, <clears throat> I can see here in the overview, right, I have seven potential findings, I have 25 artifacts, and then nine recommended responses. And we'll get into those record responses uh, a little bit later. Uh, but here I can see all my findings. I can actually dig in deeper if I want to look at a particular finding and see uh, which ones uh, may be more relevant to my investigation. I can also see the artifacts down here as well. Uh, and then I can see the number of active cases as well as the matching artifacts to this particular case. Uh, and if I want to <clears throat> have a better view and understand how the attack or threat uh, impacted my organization, we've automated the, the mapping of the timeline, right? So previously, an analyst would have to manually piece together these events and alerts into a timeline. Here, we've done it automatically for you. So you can see the initial access happen here through Microsoft Defender. So if a client is using another endpoint outside of uh, QRadar EDR, we, we have an open ecosystem to be able to integrate that data source and that telemetry into our system. So for this particular demo environment and this use case, we can see the uh, asset that was impacted was a particular PC and the uh, URL that he visited. And then we can also scroll down to see where the threat moved across my organization from a timeline perspective. And this is historically extremely difficult to do, right? Right, Manual. traditionally you had to do this manually, right? And try to piece together all this, but through analytics and through AI, we put this all together for you yeah. and correlated and enriched it with additional threat intel. Yeah. I've, I've described this as not just trying to find a needle in a haystack, but trying to find a needle in a stack of needles, right? There you so, go, yeah. that's a good analogy. Yeah. Uh, so here, this is another view. This is an attack graph. You can see the initial access here and then moving across your different hosts. Um, and then I know I touched briefly around it, right? But again, we're really trying to accelerate response. So over here to your right-hand side, we provide a second set of recommended responses. Uh, we don't actually act action those responses for you because we don't know the impact of the particular action, right? But this gives the analyst a starting point to determine what decisions they need to make quickly uh, to remediate the threat, right? So you can easily block IP addresses and then kick off orchestration and automation to the rest of your organization to communicate with, let's say, the network team or the IT team. Now, I'm, I'm blocking this particular IP address, um, so any other additional impact 
we can go uh, address those issues down the road. And do you envision that this will be fully automated one day? You can, we can definitely automate it. Uh, you can run playbooks from store, uh, but right now we leave the decision up to the security analyst, right? Because blocking the IP address may impact other applications yeah. or other servers. Uh, so we need to make sure we're in communication with the entire organization before we make any critical sure, decisions. Sure, sure, yeah. So yeah, I think that's a very cool part of the uh, Curator Suite console. And All how right. we accelerate response and investigation. All right, well IBM, uh, obviously AI is a big part of thing 2023 and it's good to see how it's now, it's been infused into security. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Thanks. Deuce. Thanks. All right, I'm here now inside the hybrid cloud area inside Think Forum, and uh, I wanted to stop by the hybrid cloud area because I think it's a fascinating topic. Uh, Arvind brought up in his keynote uh, the need for hybrid cloud. In fact, one of the data points he cited, uh, I believe the number was 77% of organizations were looking to move workloads away from public clouds back into hybrid environments. And uh, there's many reasons for that. I've done a lot of research in that area too. Uh, most notably, customers want more control over their own data. Uh, there's also a lot of data sovereignty rules. So when you get overseas into Europe, Eastern Europe, every country now has their own data requirements and compliance uh, mandates. And so companies now have to comply with that. And so that, that um, uh, furthers the need for uh, uh, hybrid environments. And lastly, and this is the big one, and uh, IBM has been on board with this now for uh, quite some time, it's the rise of edge computing. And so what edge brings is the ability to take uh, what was once historically a centralized cloud model, and I don't care if it's a private data center or a public cloud, those are all centralized compute models, and move to a more distributed environment where my distributed cloud is comprised of a series of public and private clouds as well as edge locations. Now, the challenge for businesses in that case is how do I move information, how do I move data, how do I move workloads between those environments? And IBM provides the foundation for that with OpenShift uh, via the Red Hat acquisition. And so if you're not familiar with OpenShift, it's a container platform that allows companies, uh, it creates, in effect, uh, you can think of it as a, a container fabric that is abstracted above the different uh, public cloud providers and the different private cloud platforms and, and creates one logical compute layer for companies to work with. And so I think from an IBM perspective, uh, it was very prescient for them to buy uh, Red Hat, but, but uh, OpenShift now I think um, really becomes a critical part of IT infrastructure but it, because it brings the portability of applications and data to hybrid clouds. Okay, I'm inside the AI pod now at Think Forum, and I uh, came over to where uh, Watson is, and uh, they've got a pretty cool demo set up here on how uh, the Watson Assistant can be infused into contact centers. Now, obviously, contact centers is a big area of research for me, uh, and uh, I'll give you a few data points to explain why. Uh, uh, last year, uh, in fact, uh, two-thirds of millennials Drop loyal, admitted they dropped loyalty to a brand because of a single bad experience. Uh, more and more businesses I talk to uh, say that their the competitive advantage for them is now based on customer experience. In fact, uh, one of my recent surveys showed that 95% of organizations compete directly on customer experience versus only about 25% five years ago. So you can see it's much more important today. Now, what's the role of contact center in customer experience? The contact center is obviously where a lot of customer interactions occur. And we all know the case when we call into a contact center and we got to put a bunch of data in through a, of an IVR and we don't get much help. So what Watson Assistant is here to do, it's, uh, it's not designed to replace the agent, but to be able to augment the agent and make them, in effect, a super agent, if you will. And uh, I thought the demo that they had set up here was pretty interesting because um, it shows uh, how you can run a contact center uh, without Watson. Uh, with Watson set up to just uh, basically assist the agent, but then uh, also take over and actually run, uh, answer a lot of the questions in self-service mode. And um, so they created a little gamification uh, situation where as an agent you go through certain tasks and you have to see how quickly you can look up information and answer. And the results were pretty staggering. And it showed that uh, with Watson, and with the smart assistant, uh, both customer satisfaction uh, increases, and in fact, uh, uh, in the manual mode, uh, I went through the simulation myself, and I left 97% of, of uh, requests unresolved, and that's 
very typical of a lot of contact centers today that try and do things the manual way. So I think this is a case where for organizations looking for how do I infuse AI into my organization, uh, look for the areas of biggest pain points that give you the most upside. And I think the contact center is a great starting point for that. And you know, Watson Assistant obviously is designed to integrate with most of those platforms. Well, that wraps up the ZK Tour. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll include a link to IBM Think 2023 in the description down below and for IBM as well. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm Zia Caravallo from ZK Research. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and I'll see you next time on another tour.